Welcome to Show Studio. We're here in the middle of London Fashion Week to talk about the Versus show um, while unpicking some of the other action that's been happening across London. Um, it's quite, it was quite nice to walk into the building without being screamed at by Peter protesters. There's been a lot of action both on and off the runways this season. Um, but before we jump into our dissection of, of what's going on on the rest of the Versus runway, I'll let my fabulous set of panellists who've come away from the shows to, to sit in at Show Studio to talk about what's going on, just to introduce themselves, starting with you, Kabat. I'm Cosette McCreary. Um, I was part of a brand called Sibling, and I'm now um, freelancing and, um, yes, a gun for hire, if anybody is of, has, <laughs> is of interest. Which they should <laughs> indeed be. Um, I'm Amna. I'm co-founder and editor-in-chief of a new magazine called Cause and Effect. And yeah, that, that's it. That's me. <laughs> My name is Dan Thorley. I'm the editor-in-chief of A Magazine, curated by and the Paris editor of Vogue Italia. And my long-suffering partner in crime. <laughs> <laughs> so, as I said, there's been lots going on this Fashion Week, and it's interesting. One of the biggest things that I think has emerged is brands sort of really, really trying to establish themselves as youth-orientated labels. You know, we saw that mm -hmm. last night with Burberry, with what they did at their show, and both sort of on the runway, but also in terms of the people that they had front row and this desire that brands have to sort of establish themselves as yeah, youth-orientated, digital-focused, often seasonless brands, which is exactly the strategy that Versus are going for. What do we make of this? And like, as someone who's been a part of the Fashion Week sort of wheel and circle, because what do you feel, how can brands sort of cut through all of the noise to actually make a point? Yeah, I mean, it's a difficult, it's a difficult thing, because when you start off with a brand, I think the thing that um, is always really important is trying to get that emotional engagement with your product. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like, why would I, for instance, buy a versus bum bag over a Prada one. Mm. Well, it's because I have an emotional connection to that piece. Mm. Um, it's still a black bum bag. But um, I think what in this sort of digital, sort of social media kind of age is it's important to, um, you know, get that engagement with a younger audience um, because they will okay, potentially they may not be able to afford to buy your brand at that moment, but in the long term, they'll be somebody that will stay with you. Maybe they'll just buy the accessories or, you know, in the case of Burberry last night, the baseball cap, you know, that kind of thing. So you have to have your eye on your, um, you know, your, your public and who's going to be buying your collections in the future if you want to do something that's quite long term. Mm. What do you, you so go ahead. Oh, oh sorry, <laughs> I, I was thinking about long term and, and it's interesting you say that, but when, because the topic at hand is really uh, what we were saying is that revolving door of designers at mm. houses, how do you then keep, you know, the same customer yeah. and how yeah. do you keep the same, um, uh, consumer interested and devoted because there is no real consistency yeah. you know they kind of they fall in love with one creative director's vision and what they're doing with the brand. Do you think that's more to do with you know someone like Versace, like Donatella for mm. instance who's mm. kind of oh of course will be over curating it do you think it's because she's has a very strong vision and also because Versace itself and mm. Versus mm. is like such a you know, it's a, like a unique animal. It has such a sort of DNA that if she picks the right people to collaborate with, that DNA won't get too distorted. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You're right. I mean, and th this is in Versace's case, I think, or Versus's case, definitely. Um, because, I mean, with every designer they've had, there's been so much references to, you know, the Versace collections and older Versus collections that they've never really steered away from, mm -hmm. you know, the kind of, like you said, the Versace or the Versus DNA. Yeah. Um, but I think that this is, you know, specific to that. Um, whereas I think that with other brands like, I don't know, like with Dior, you know, there is such a shift yeah. in vision from yeah. um, uh, Raph Simmons to, you know, um, that I think that there isn't that, you can't keep that consistency with, with 
your buyer or with your customer. It's interesting, isn't it? Because the model that she went for, the versus model of get inviting in these sort of guest designers mm -hmm. to, to, you know, sometimes they've had more formal roles. Sometimes it feels like it is like a guest collection. So you had like, you know, mm -hmm. Christopher Kane and then Jonathan Anderson, Anthony Macarello, inviting people in to sort of do a season. You know, she's, they've gone into the celebrity arena with having like Zayn Malik do one and what have you. Am I, yeah. Kind of felt a bit, a bit, um, a bit odd, I think, when she first started it, but now that's like seems to be a model that other people are adopting. Like, there's been a lot of hype and buzz and talk about the Helmet Lang collection, mm -hmm. yeah. which is obviously taking that exact model and it's getting people in on this kind of temporary basis and almost turning this revolving door of designers that everyone's complaining about into a sort of selling benefit as if it's somehow it's a huge PR benefit. I mean, yeah. that we, you know, yeah. there's always chatter about, you know, who's going to take it on mm. next. Um, you know, it doesn't matter which house it is. You know, the fact that there are the people talking, yeah. you know, oh, is Stefano Pilati going to go to Blah, yeah. or Ricardo or whoever mm -hmm. um, you know that's it's that's a huge amount of you know online chatter that Buzz, just is, yeah. just pushes you know your brand forward so in that way I think she was incredibly clever well because it's turning something that can see it can feel like a negative thing when someone's leaving a brand and you're getting a new person into something like it's considered yeah. and deliberate you know yeah. like, oh, these people aren't going to stay forever they're going to do a guest collection yeah and she seems very supportive um, and it feels like it's almost like the Donatella sort of finishing school. <laughs> it's like she gives you your blessing and then Very you go mother. off. Exactly. And you go off and she then still supports you. Yeah. I mean, as far as I'm aware, she's still, you know, publicly supporting Chris Kane. Yeah, they're very close. You know, yeah. she keeps everybody in, like, that in that little family. Exactly. Which I think is amazing. Staying quiet, Dan, what do you think? Well, I think that this whole discussion has a lot to do with an enormous generation gap. Mm -hmm. And we're at a time where everybody is pivoting their communication strategy towards digital natives because of our generation, we adopted these these modes of communication progressively, whereas now they're sort of shifting their gaze towards the dollar of those people that were born with that endless knowledge at their fingertips, but they were not born necessarily with the fashion culture that we strived for and searched for yeah. and, and understood. And I think that uh, what you would, this rotation is also a lot to do with that idea of a false newness, which, mm -hmm. um, is not only being applied to Versace, but is also being applied to, um, as you said, Helmut Lang, this idea of, of rotation being an actual almost selling point for the project. And perhaps that ties into the idea of limited edition, of exclusivity. But either way, it is allowing all of these creative director typed roles to emerge that don't, that don't require either um, you know, originality or any sort of respect for moving forward it actually it's actually allowing as much sort of scraping through the archives and and, and repetition yeah. and mm -hmm. and uh sort of under the name of heritage under the name of archive as possible so yeah. it's just quite fascinating to see who takes that role and actually you know puts their own stamp on it in a mm -hmm. in a fresh way mm -hmm. in my opinion i think that christopher and jonathan were the two that did that in the most interesting way. Mm. Um, if we look at the Definitely. way Christopher's signatures also merged with Versace's signatures in terms that worked of really, that was an style aesthetic. of dresses, Actually, the way that he sort of really punched florals into, into what he did, that sort of coquettish, softer side that he's been known for really, really showed. And then in, again, Jonathan Anderson had a very short stint in that role, but... Um, what was it, one or two collections? I'm not sure. I think it was. He did two. Was it two? Two, wasn't two. It? two. Yeah. But either That's way, you, I mean. you like felt that his... New York. That yeah. was the thing that stands mm. in my mind. And I think the the imagery that actually that they did for Jonathan's was, mm. reminded me of the old imagery from the because stuff that I remembered. In that sense, you know, he respected his view on the archives in a nice way as well, mm. and the parts yeah. of it that he loved, the sort of sort of gender aligned eroticism and, and the, mm -hmm. the real adolescent Bruce Weber era, all of that. He's that been he quoted that he's, yeah, um, yeah. Was was there, but also more of his asymmetry, the sort of, mm -hmm. those really, those things that we associate with J.W. Anderson, even the pops of unusual colors that he included, I thought um, was interesting. 
but again, these things do feel very flash in the pan, and, and I, I don't feel like that they're brand building in, in the sense of, of really special pieces. Like I don't, I don't know anyone who's saying, oh, you know, he's still rocking that versus piece or something. You know, like <laughs> sorry, only I, me I, that. Unfortunately, it's like. But I guess the thing is trying to get that balance I could find between it. newness and like consistency. Because if you look at something like Supreme, which is another example of these like constant collaborations and like revolving door of collaborations, you know, this, mm. Supreme is so good at that. What's really clever is there's this like built language that is always there that people identify with and they feel is authentic. And then they do all this sort of like flash in the pan thing that has that veneer of like, get it now. If you don't get it, you're going to miss it. Mm -hmm. But I think what's hard with fashion brands is just trying to get that balance right between having like an actual core to base something on and then being able to go out and invite other people in. I don't know if anyone's quite getting that, getting that right. And I also question whether you talked about this sort of like guise of newness, whether newness is something that young people really, like, it's like it just become this accepted thing that you have to be new all the time for people to engage with your product. And I don't know if that is entirely the case. Yeah, it will be interesting, I think, in the next sort of year or so to see how the big houses kind of pan this out, whether there'll be less of these kind of short-term collaborations. I mean, at Sibling, we worked on you know, quite a few collaborations. And we always said, we want to keep these going for at least three seasons. Mm. And I think if you look at somebody like, you know, James Long or what have you for Iceberg, um, you know, it feels like the Iceberg kind of uh, James Long uh, creative direction is only now just coming just through, coming through yeah. even though he's been there for, I think, coming up for two years. Um, they've been very clever. They've done it um, very carefully, they've done it very slowly, mm. at their own pace, and for That's me... That's surprising for them because they've also fired people, like a whole ton of people before him in very, very exactly. short periods of time. Exactly, and so. for me it makes me feel that they're coming at it from a, from a different kind of angle, and perhaps that's where you know, everyone is going to shift because I think we've actually got a bit of sensory overload. I mean, I'm a bit of an old fart, I mean, I have to admit, but I love, I love like the internet and I was a really early adopter of everything to do with the internet because I found it very exciting. Yeah. Um, the only thing I didn't like was the fact that a lot of people didn't really get the references didn't credit, I couldn't understand why a picture, they'd grab a screen, grab a picture, but wouldn't credit the photographer or yeah. find out who the photographer was or, It's the know. speed thing though, isn't it? Like there's a, I think I mentioned this the other day, but there's a nice interview on Show Studio with David Sims and he talks about how a sense of propriety has been lost in the rush for content. And that's kind of exactly yeah. what we're talking about here is this like constant need to create a story, no matter what the yeah. story is. Yeah seems to be the driving force behind a lot of what's going on in fashion and this sense of like as you said sort of crediting and being like the sense of appropriateness and authenticity and and even like to an extent sort of like ethical things like sustainability have been lost with this desire to create a constant conversation yeah, absolutely i mean i remember i mean i've always been obsessed with um, with fashion and was very lucky that my father was very good friends with Joseph and his brother, so I had kind of like the run of Sloan Street. Um, but there would be pieces that I would like wish that I had. I'd have to wait for a birthday or Christmas mm. or something like that. But there were pieces of clothing that I'd just be like, I really, really want that. And I'd either try and go out and earn the money to buy it or I'd get it as a gift. And then I would wear it until it was falling apart. I have an equipment shirt that I still, I bought with my first wage packet and I still have it like mm. 30 years later. I mean, mm. that's, that to me doesn't, you know, that's the way I like to buy, you know, expensive mm. garments or branded garments. Mm. I like to have it in my wardrobe for a very, very long time. It's really interesting that you say that because I've been thinking a lot at the moment because obviously Arcot has opened on the high street and everyone, there was like a glist glut of articles around Arcot, which is owned by H&M. So yeah. it's kind of a bit alarming because that section of Regent Street, it's like all owned by them. It's like, and other stories, H&M and Arcot. But I was like, this is a high street. Of course, yeah. Sorry, I went, what? <laughs> oh my God, yeah, terrifying. <laughs> 
But anyways, it, like a brand like H and M, like no one is going to done their research on how people are shopping better than H and M. Yeah. And Arca is the opposite of what is going on in high fashion. It's all like your staples. Like it's like H and M does Uniqlo. It's like yeah. t-shirts, shirts. It's it's all repeat purchase stuff. It's something that you'd buy, you'd wear until it, you know it gone through the wash too many times and you needed another white shirt or another navy jumper. But they obviously feel like there's a massive market for that. So I found that quite interesting, that on the high street, it's kind of this conversation around, like, staple pieces, but then everything that high fashion is talking about is like this, get it now, get it now, it's going to look good this yeah. season. It's kind yeah. of... It's interesting to see a shop like that open in this but time. I think, unfortunately, there's a huge confusion in the industry at the moment about the, who the consumer is of the consumer of information and the actual consumer of product because as we all know fashion's never been as fashionable as it is today people have never looked towards fashion enormous populations all across the world have access mm -hmm. to it like never like they never have before barriers are being broken down in every single way whether it's you know m more stores opening in different places whether it's the whether it's just the visibility whether it's education it's just so visible but the fact is, of course, there are new markets opening as well, and there's new consumers, but they're still going to be affluent consumers. They're still going to be a certain level of income, and that, confu that confusion sort of runs so far deeply in, in the fact that, you know, where do products actually hit, at what age level, at what income bracket, and mm -hmm. um, I think part of this sort of huge thing that brands like Versus and Kenzo, Hel Helmut Lang, it's there. there's, a, there's a lot of these brands that live in that kind of upper contemporary space that perhaps are trying to reach for a much larger um, bracket of, of the population than they can ever really genuinely touch with their product. Mm -hmm. So I think that popularization is, is diluting to a certain degree. and. Um, you know, we're of course seeing different brands targeting different different people. You know, London Fashion Week is filled with you know exclusive private shows with socialites, and then there's you know big shows happening in New York like Alexander Wang that literally happen on the street and allow anybody to to see it in in the middle of Manhattan before the editors actually saw it on um, in in Brooklyn. I mean, there's so many different ways of communicating, um, but that means that there's some people getting lost in what should actually what should actually be coming from their from their brand yeah mm. yeah it feels like the show is going to start quite shortly but i think that's a good point to keep in mind like through it like i was looking at the new versus ads and they've got like these eight like young cool people basically you know they're like artists and musicians whatever like and i just looked at it and i felt really kind of numbed by it because i was like i've just seen i can't look at another brand championing a young creative like it's mm -hmm. it's just kind of and it feels really false because every brand is doing it and they're doing it in partner with a partnership with like dazed and it's like blah 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 blah. and you look at it and you think but like what's the point of difference like and i think it's that's what feels a bit, yeah. it feels a bit tokenistic doesn't it you know like you've got um the kind of overused buzzword of diversity and it's mm -hmm. like here it is you know kind of underground culture diverse um here's an activist i mean they're all talented and they're all you know great at what they do and they're all quite special but it doesn't they all need it, cash it, <laughs> yeah no that's true <laughs> that's a, like, they it doesn't money. feel sincere is what i'm trying to say it just doesn't come off as sincere and I'd also i also don't blame them for saying yes either yeah no no no, no absolutely not because it's i absolutely. think i think yeah. it's a testament to them as actually you know as real voices that the brands actually find them and believe in them enough to believe that the public will will like oh, believe yeah, in that yeah. collaboration uh, so no, yeah, I, mean, they, I feel like they need to keep their integrity to a certain level and choose carefully who they work with and that sort of thing as well but i mean the brands are sort of probably reaching out to you know 20 until one says yes so but then you think like how it just becomes repetitive like i was thinking of this slightly with adjura when she closed the burberry show where like adjura is definitely like been a very interesting person like carving out girls talk in that space mm -hmm. I mean, it's like how, like how many brands will work with her before you look at it and you don't trust the relationship between the brand and her anymore because she just feels like an it face rather than a brand. Show. Yeah. Oh, show. Show so. starting. <laughs> but it's, I think that's the problem with these, like, young... Yeah, but she's still a model in the end of, at the end yeah, of the day. So yeah, that's, yeah. I mean, there's... say she's got a good... That's a different legitimacy yeah. in yeah. a way. Um, I think 
the alignment through her projects needs to be careful, like Coach, Coach sponsored her recently. Mm. But I mean, I think, I think it's, it still remains a controversial thing and I'm sure you know, she's very well positioned to, to be looked after and to be guided in doing that. Yeah. Um, other people, maybe less. It's like we've got a check going on. I know. <laughs> it's all about the check. It's all about season. the check. Daniela Westbrook finally vindicated. It's interesting, a lot of the editors I'm seeing in the last few days are all in an oversized blazers. Yeah. Like there's a lot of that. Oh my that, God, that naked the man. The sort of corporate. That naked man. Why did I miss that? <laughs> I was there. Suddenly, there's a giant penis in front of the screen. But you were tweeting on your way here that you like love uh, Donatella Versace. Oh, I'm obsessed. Why? What is it Versace? about? I think, to be honest, I think a lot of it comes from the fact that when her brother passed away, mm -hmm. I think everybody just thought, well, it's kind. Of, either that's kind of the end of it, or who were they going to get in to do the designing? Because right. you know, yes, she's part of the business, but I don't think anybody, to be fair took it very seriously well, that she'd be able to do it. Well, because as a party girl, even though she exactly. had a huge say in what Gianna Versace exactly. you yeah. know, created. And he was like the genius and no one was going she to be able to news. do it. And I just think she's brilliant. And I have yeah. this thing for these, like, you know, these, these women who are basically told they can't really do something or they're not expected to do something. Mm. And she turned it around. She did. And the company was in a mess. Yeah. And she had to, I think, make some very difficult decisions about closing stores and mm -hmm. probably getting rid of a lot of people and a lot of different lines and what have you. And I think she's done a damn good job. No, she's mm -hmm. amazing. And then she's just fabulous. I mean, in the, you know, in the era of social media, um, I just love watching her sort of Instagram or her, or even her dog's Instagram. I mean, I'm that bad. <laughs> her bucket challenge was... Her bucket, bucket challenge, exactly. I mean, after the, when we used to do the menswear shows, I'd always like say to um, actually Daniel Marks from the communication store, I'd be like, I just want my final pitch has been me flanked by a lot of male models with their tops off. <laughs> and he just came up to me once and went, you're there. I was like, I have this picture of Donatella in my mind and that's why I want to be. No, she is amazing. But also what I love about her is people find her so sort of like fabulous. But really, she just behaves how men behave. Exactly. Like, you know, but people are like, God, she's fabulous. Yeah, well, I way. love that. Well, just, you know, she just like, She's just quite She just hangs out with hot young people. Like, yeah, it, you know, yeah. it's, she just behaves like how a man behaves. But she, she feels, it, but that feels like she wants to be there yeah. and it feels like yeah. the other people also want to be oh, there be around you know, her be yeah. Around yeah. she seems to me like she's a hell of a lot of fun she's fabulous what do you make of the show i found it quite interesting that it started with that big run of tailoring especially because yeah exactly and those sort of bucket hats and yeah. things like that but mainline Versace, obviously this is designed by the studio now that mm -hmm. i has gone to san Ron. it's interesting because mainline Versace has gone very sort of like active sporty yes. yeah like lots of Absolutely. leggings and billowing sort of windbreakers and parkers and jackets so yeah. to see the kind of tailoring at the start this is quite interesting but this is gorgeous i'm loving this a lot of western stuff. influence stuff it's really nice what did you say Dan? a lot of western influence a lot of western shirts cowboy lariats you can thank raf simmons at calvin klein for that mood of the season <laughs> are we enjoying the show what do you think Hamner? um I, I'm always looking for that reference, the things that I love about Ver Versus and, um, and about Versace. So I think that that's, you know, that's not really fair because you can't just keep going back to the archive and like regurgitating the same uh, silhouettes and the same, you know, pins. And, but there's a part of me that's, really nostalgic and always kind of waits for that, wait, waiting to see the Medusa somehow, yeah. some way. Um, well, there it, seems to be a big focus on all the more equestrian yeah, and the yeah. and bridles yeah, yeah. and things. Exactly. What strikes me is, in, in my mind, um, Versace and Versus is, is a lot about a total look. Mm -hmm. It's a lot about that woman, you know, in the dress, mm -hmm. in, you know, in the, the mini skirt. And here I'm seeing like, it's very much styled separates, mm -hmm. which is yeah. kind of, Perhaps a little surprising because you know, scarf, hat, singlet, mm -hmm. jacket, yeah, you, skirt, you're right. you think bag. Like, yeah. like it's very 
styled. Yeah. Yes. When you think of this, you think of a party show. dress. I don't know because Robbie right. Spencer did the adverts, didn't he? But I don't yeah, know. I whether... don't think he's not doing this because he's. It at doesn't MMC. feel like his. Um, doesn't feel like his handwriting. Does no, it's it not particularly? Him. I think it's interesting, though, that you say that the main line has gone very sporty mm. because this, and correct me if I'm wrong, I mean, versus Versace was the diffusion line. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you're already kind of doing luxury sportswear, mm. it must then be quite difficult when you're doing the diffusion line of thinking, because that naturally would be kind of where your luxury sportswear would It's not a good time for diffusion sit. lines. Like, everyone is closing them, basically. Mm. Yeah. Mark by There's mark, very few yeah. that actually work. Like, you know, Rick Owens, Dr. Lowe is one that works. But like, Prada, you wouldn't even call Mew Mew a diffusion line. It's a completely no. separate brand. Yeah. yeah. But there's like, and it's kind of, I'm interested in the sort of next five years to see what will happen with Versus, like whether, it will it will become like a Mew Mew where it's kind of its own thing. Yeah. Or whether it will become I mean, a I quiet. I kind of quite wanted line. this to be a bit trashier, but that's probably yeah, just me, me too. being a bit trashy. No, but I know <laughs> what you mean. You want it to be really unapologetic. I think for Catwalk, I always expect things to just be a bit more over the top. Mm. And she yeah. always quotes herself as being punk and as being this, you know, her influence has always been this like rock chick. And I... I just don't quite see that in. But I think it's really oh. hard to do that at the moment, isn't it? There's such this climate of like oh, of progressive, course. androgynous, sort of gender neutral, whatever. Yeah. So it's really hard to do something like sexy, sexy without feeling really sort of like sort Funny of old some school. Of these looks that it almost more airs into like Mary Emily kind of territory in a, in a certain way. The the Paco Rabanne, the the mm -hmm. diesel diesel black gold, the Louis Vuitton sort of sp sport. Athleisure coming through in this jersey dresses, mm. the sort of sort of lower cut um, yeah. skirts and things. It's it's funny to see how much this, a stylist will, when there is a lot more pieces involved, actually their footprint becomes so much yeah. more important. And also, so. I think you again, like everybody's thinking about things as a business. I mean, even when we used to do like runway looks with either. Matthew Joseph or Judy Blame, there was always the idea of, okay, how many pieces, and at the beginning with Katie Grant, how many pieces do we need to get on the catwalk mm. because they're going into the selling mm. collection? Yeah. And that can often make for quite a boring show. Yeah. Because you're just doing your sales collection one thing after the other mm -hmm. because your buyers are looking on Instagram and they're seeing mm -hmm. what pictures are getting put up, what they what's getting liked, yeah. all that type of stuff. But this cluttered mentality, like you really I really felt that uh, it is that like I, everyone always gets angry at me on the comments on YouTube because they're like, Louis talks about Gucci, but I'm gonna do it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> this like pile it on thing. It is actually quite a commercially savvy thing to do because it means that everything yeah. can have when it's sold in e retail that like runway look thing. Yeah. I really felt that at Burberry, like the fact that there was like scarves and caps and these big earrings and like jackets with, you know, a top underneath and then a skirt one underneath that. And as going back to Dan's point, which I think is really interesting, when I think of verses, I think of like a short black. We also think of night dress. of evening wear and this show with all the bucket hats really any... makes it immediately a day wear grounding because it's, yes. this hat is like it's Not. like stuff you buy, isn't it? It's it like is loads like, of product. Yeah. Like it's product, product, product in every look. Like it's product or not, it's just like directionally. Like I yes, just, there's a dark yeah. eye. Yes, there's mm, like certain yeah. tropes of of evening. Yeah. But you put that hat on and you put like a satchel, and it immediately becomes like a girl yeah. on the street. Yeah. Um, so I found it a little bit confused. This. Yeah. I mean, I love the denim section. I think that was really very particularly strong. I think, unfortunately, the beginning section, for me, having seen the Burberry check, I'm kind of just feels like, oh, Burberry have just kind that, of done yeah. it. But I mean, they would have done this months mm. in advance, so they weren't to know that. Um, but it sort of doesn't feel very sexy. It doesn't even yeah. feel that kind of Isabel Moran kind of... Or cohesive, you know. Yeah. Yeah. But I think it's that interesting point about, it's also going back to like, probably market research in terms of what people are buying and wearing. It's like, if you are going to buy a party dress, like maybe that's not the audience that they're going for now. And they've accepted mm -hmm. that those party dress women are going to either go, you know, either they have the money to go, oh, she, she is. She is, she is she as well. Is. Like, she looks good. Ooh, dress see, she looks wearing. fab. Iconic. Yeah. But she looks fab. that's also very, like, it's more loose. It's sort of, it's, it's that's less. not very her look. I know. See what I'm saying? Like, it's, that's what I'm trying to say. It's got this, this like groundedness to the whole collection, which like, 
makes it made it seem a lot yeah. more day we're oriented. Was yeah. it the first the first time they came back to London? I think didn't they start with a whole load of blonde girls with crew cuts, taking from that brilliant picture that was of Ev, and I just remember seeing that and thinking whoever styled that and cast that mm. was a genius because mm. it again was a memory that I had of this brilliant mm. brilliant image and these three girls just came out and it was like okay that's but fantastic. you think of that you think of like big hair like skinny legs and like an asymmetric skirt coming you know you don't think of but, bucket hats but I am like will that audience who wants like day wear like cool day wear like what is going to make them go to versus not acne or you know anything else. that that's what i think but is are we overestimating the customers sort of avant-gardeness of of versace because are they are they perhaps more a d squared customer for for, mm. for example like yeah, that's partially. my question because it's not my world then what but, d squared i think if i saw a d squared show i'd feel much more excited than yeah. i do having seen that sure sure but it perhaps is that this but are they existing more in that that's space what now? i mean with that ad campaign that they just did with all these kind of like you know vaguely sort of like underground young creators it's like if the versus audience is the person that would also buy philip Pine or d squared mm. like go for that mm. or if it's the person who would buy helmet lang shane oliver go for that but mm. i'm not quite yeah. sure what it is because the advert says to me Where that it it's helmet lang yeah. shane oliver but the clothes mm. and and kind of like the veneer of the brand is much more d, d, d squared. Philippine. But Versus has always promoted a sort of young and healthy sort of customer, I think, as well. If you think about it, there's there's often been that sort of like camaraderie feeling in the gang sort of sort of sort of imagery that they they create too, which which does it's it seems kind of re relatively harmless. It's kind of like a, about a little bit of a sexy attitude, but it's it never yeah, really goes. Yeah, but it's a sort of healthy. Yeah. But yeah. also, it's a healthy sort of sexiness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Ways, Absolutely. Where... I mean, even if you look at the the girls that they've chosen, there's a lot of of girls of of the moment who are sort of sort of a lot of the diverse and young but editorial kind of faces. They haven't gone for the Insta girls. No, they haven't gone for supermodels. Least, yeah. Like obviously because it's the young line, the, there's a, the, the Versace girl is very different to the Versus girl. Yeah, but when they so, first did you know, London, they had Gigi Hadid, Bella Hadid. So it is, you're right, okay. it's interesting that it's kind of- Now it's more like- It's young. Like Maris, um, Kiki Willems, all these kind of really editorial big catwalk girls. I just question if an audience like, like sees that, do you know what I mean? Like I would just wonder like what the customer who, like I always think of the Versace H&M collaboration and I remember I was at St. Martin's when it came out and our tutor like sent us to stand in the queue and like speak to people who were buying it. Mm -hmm. And like these weren't people who read Dazed and people who loved fashion, but they consumed it in a different mm. way to how a lot of people in the fashion industry consume it where they like, you know, read the days 100 and like buy id magazine these people didn't care about that they liked fabulous fashion and i wonder if they'll look at this and find it that's fabulous. a little bit about what i was trying to touch on earlier about the disconnect between the actual customer and who they believe is watching because like yeah. there seems to be like a renewed or a new trust in the micro influencer in that sense yeah. like these models are all you know they all have their audience they have their fans and everything but are they the versus Exactly. As as I, yeah. I don't think so. But is no. it the state of the you know, best fashion whereas industry? Whereas you've got a more sure bet if you go for the Tommy, Gigi, Mick, you know, that kind yeah. of thing, because they are going to hit sort of a, a denominator that is tuned into that sort yeah. of space, yeah. celebrity I, space. I really yeah. don't know with this collection that we just saw who it's for. I really, I, I don't see the demographic. I don't mm. see why they would go for to versus for that you went to versus for a very specific yeah um, the uh, black dress with safety pins but, yeah you do yeah it's just something a bit sort of fun and sexy absolutely all the, all the printed jeans all that printed had that, jeans. that yes. had that motif yes you know? exactly. absolutely with the you know you just get your black you wear a safety jeans pin with your purpose yeah exactly i wear it every day <laughs> <laughs> It was actually just a cue card. <laughs> but, you know, you could just get your versus jeans with your mm. or like a little, on the back. Yeah. little top to wear out, yeah. out at night, a little band, like think, off the shoulder. I, I think, bought my sister a versus dress. I just remembered. Like, I think really what we have yes. to yeah. remember with this one, though, is that potentially this could be an interim period. Because well, there's all these rumours of a new, there's new like director going in it. Week, yeah, isn't there, I, think. But I mean, imagine if Ricardo honest. sort of does finally take the reins at Versace, perhaps like it could become 
his, his baby as well, if he looked over mm. the two lines. I mean, how much would that pot potentially make sense that all the, mm -hmm. you know, his t-shirt culture, his jersey hoodie culture, his, you know, boys in skirts and, and pants and all that yeah. sort of thing, if that got filtered into verses, that could be quite interesting. Yeah, I do just no? feel like it needs, it just feels a little bit this um, like collection. A breather, like of. it's just being a little, playing it a little mm. bit safe. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah I agree um, with that. Which I think, you know, it goes back to what Dan was saying about this thirst for newness and this feeling that you have to move something on. It's like, in a way, I'd rather they'd have just done a collection of like printed denim and safety pin dresses again. But the problem is, it's like the fashion pack would then write like, oh, it's the same as ever. But I'd say like, does that matter? But people are scared to kind of do, it's like once you do something well, you then have to change it. Yeah. yeah, it's that awful kind of thing with fashion. Because all the reviews, you know, whenever you you read a review of uh, some of the Christopher Kane um, collections for Versus or J.W. Anderson, so many of them were like, oh, they just borrowed. They just borrowed from the archive. It's so obvious that they borrowed from the archive. And yet I still felt like they had their own stamp on it and well. gave us what we wanted yeah. from Versus at the same time. And it's a massive yeah. archive. And there must be like things in that archive that, you know, you, they could be continually referenced in yeah. a new oh, way. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, and Jonathan, really familiar, and then there's the stuff that's perhaps not so. We're forgetting how important it is that it's an Italian brand, and mm. I yes. don't think we saw the Italian no. touch no. in yeah. the show. Yeah. It had a very urban, maybe more New where York. Was than actually, mm -hmm. Where was that actually? Where was that show actually? Um, where was where was that catwalk actually? London. What's the location? In, what's the location? Central St Martins. Oh, it was at Central St Martins. Okay, mm -hmm. and obviously with the banks of the like you know the speakers behind, it's a, that kind of festival but vibe, the I suppose. Had, it's but it's like British. You know, it's kind of well, it's not. It's like it depends on your reference. It like I think Brits would see that as like a sort of you know bit blur. British. Yeah, a bit blur <laughs> like Manchester. Whereas New Yorkers would see that as like a hip hop. So, you know, it's kind of. But I wouldn't see it as an Italian thing. Is it at St. 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 Martin's because of the scholarship she's just awarded? Oh, I mean, no, like or just a scholarship? Or she's yeah, like, yeah, okay, yeah. Probably. She's just, she's just started this scholarship. Show, I mean, it's, it's a, if you want to think, overthink it, like to, to place a, an Italian contemporary brand line in like the absolute pinnacle of British We've got Armani fashion design. Showing yeah, yeah. In, in I mean, London as well. It's kind of yeah. weird that all these Italian brands are... It's not weird, it's just it's placement, invited. it's about mm -hmm. geographic placement. Like we've been, I mean, ha linking that idea of London youth culture to what yeah. you're doing. But that's why I think it's with, it made so much sense when they first came over and did their first show because it had quite a punk mm. spirit. I know mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. punk spirit is quite a sort of trotted out um, mm -hmm. thing now. If you just put a safety pin on it, everybody thinks mm -hmm. it's punk. It again opens up that message of what is London because there's that East London idea. Does that even make sense anymore? Yeah. And there's West London and I mean, there's so many different parts of what mm. this all comes together. I don't think the customer that lives in or that, that makes up one ideal is necessarily gonna buy into the one that they're encapsulating the entire city with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and also London is probably like, I don't want London fine, but like Britain is not in exactly a like radical sort of like punkish place at the moment. Like I'm just yeah. moving from No, Brooks. I wish. <laughs> like, do you know what I, mean? I wish like, it was. That's what's weird yeah. is it's like that avant-garde thing that like British fashion has yeah. always had just feels a little undermined at the moment. So yeah, totally. And it's interesting what you said about, you know, the whole thing of reviews and, you know, critics and, you know, the review you get after your show with the onset of like, people putting things online and Twitter and Instagram and all that type of stuff. If you get a bad review, you can just like it and then just put another review that's nicer over the top. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. I, the general public potentially isn't even reading those reviews. I don't think the general public is reading them. I think even those general those fashion reviews. public are reading them. <laughs> Sorry. No, it's really true. It's, it's true. really true. Yeah. You can't review, review is that less many and less shows. important. Yeah. It's, it's insane. But also, yeah. most reviewers aren't critics. They're publicists anyway. Like, they don't write anything. Exactly. <laughs> which is why I like, like reading, you know, like, uh, you know, Tim Blanks' pieces mm. and things like that. People that actually go, yeah, I didn't like that. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's like, and my favourite thing Good. was he reviewed a Jill Sandy collection and he said, he like described a Jill Phil Pagliolunga's outfit at the end and said like at least his, um, like he was like it wasn't a great look but at least it made sense unlike the rest of the collection. <laughs> It's really good, it made me laugh. But I know what you mean. It's it's just it's a weird time in fashion in general. Like 
who are the... Because also brands are all operating like content producers anyway, so then that further undermines the roles of journalists and magazines when, yeah. you know, someone like Gucci is making more innovative, interesting editorial content than a lot of yes. magazines yeah. are. Yeah, they can afford to do. Lutchford is yeah, and they quite can amazing. To do it. Yeah. But even the little projects that they're doing, yeah. you know, if you look at Prada with their sort of, you know, their museum, I was going to put their sort of Prada Foundation where it's, you know, you can go and see these fantastic exhibitions. Mm -hmm. You do start to... The brands have entered the cultural space so much that the role of, of these impartial cultural critics or you know artists or journalists is, is just gone. They're all in the brand's pocket. It goes back to what I was saying about young people being employed by brands to be sort of like tastemakers promoting Versus or Burberry or whoever. So, mm, depressing state of affairs. Yeah. <laughs> well, just a confusing one. Oh, just, yeah. I, think. I, mean, I think a lot of things need to just be stopped and started again in a lot of ways, mm -hmm. really. In the end, it is that person with the dollar that is going to be trying to digest all of this and deciding what they're going to buy. And is this a See Now, see now Buy Now collection? Yeah. So I thought she stopped that. No, she it's, it's meant while. to be, like, seasonless. So you, oh, I think right. it is available, like, now. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see who looks at this and also because of how much styling there is, like looks at it and goes, oh, I want to buy the T-shirt underneath the coat with the, yeah. you know, like uh, there's so many different levels of proportions going on as well that it's like, it's quite um, extensive. Mm. It's, it's not, for me, it's not conducive to the idea of, of um, going on straight after and, 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 yeah. and going, oh, I'm going to pick up that, that great jeans a pair of jeans or that great yeah, you can't really see anything because it's really complicated you said you wish we could like turn it off and start everything again what what's our big hopes of all of us for sort of fashion week and the way that all of these conversations are going to develop what do we think is most important well, i mean happen? i think it's interesting that dan like touched on the fact that you know there were so many like you know fashion colleges and there were so many people like in the fashion industry, doing fashion, there's this huge push when you come out of like a big fashion college to do, you know, another collection. I mean, I know it from stopping sibling. I mean, within two weeks of saying that sibling was on hiatus, I was being asked to do another collection. Mm -hmm. And you, it's a bit like- Design oh, someone else's or do, continue no, do my do my own thing. So it was a bit like, um, you know, you need a break. Sometimes we just need a break, and I don't know where the um, where youth is going to go next. Maybe there will be a backlash mm. against these so-called influencers, and maybe there'll be a backlash um, on this huge amount of Instagram and social media. Mm. I mean, there's always already been with brands like Dolce and Gabbana. I mean, people are sick of seeing that, you know. But also the relationships with influencers and the commercial side of what they're doing is actually changing because the push for transparency is is bigger and bigger. There's I know that really in, in Germany... There's a really big Guardian in this yesterday. It's, okay. They're cracking down on it in the UK. In, in or, Germany as well. Yeah. It's become um, a huge... Uh, legal People are being made to remove adult. Instagram posts. Um, I really badly cut my hand. Oh, no. <laughs> Just keep going. <laughs> um, the, yeah, it's, it's illegal. It's basically people are being paid to, to promote things and are not showing it. And, yeah. and, they, yeah. and they are, yeah. they're called influencers for a reason. Instagram because, have rolled out that thing where it now says at the top, like, paid for in collaboration with... Have you seen that on anyone's Yes, but that's uh -huh. become a choice. That's a yeah. choice. And, yeah. you know, I mean, other people have been doing the ad hashtag for yeah. a couple of months now, um, yeah. or creating their own, within their own system. There's a huge um, amount of money, especially in the beauty yeah. industry. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Like, yeah. People get paid a fortune mm. to yeah. do something. But there are some posts that I've seen on people's Instagrams this time where it's like hashtag ad, and I can't even work out who's paying them. I'm like, are the, like, are the brands paying you to be at the show, or is it the beauty brand that are sponsoring the show mm. who've paid you to post this, or is it like, you know... You the, just put a hashtag in. Yeah, <laughs> but like, I'm like, who is it, or is it, you know, the fur company that's provided the fur or the company that's provided the crystal i'm like who is it that's, that's mm. paying for this and like what are they hoping to achieve through this and yeah. there's yeah. so many like sponsored it's it's really and i do think of course there's going to be a backlash against yeah. that like yeah. but what maybe that's why it's interesting to see that that hasn't been the tactic this time with versus you know this i mean i'm sure we'll see a lot of content being generated afterwards but it's clearly not for the 
girls walking in the show that have, I mean, I'd like to see who was on the front row because that might give us a little bit yeah, more yeah. insight yeah. who they're actually yeah. trying to position exactly. this towards. Mm. I don't know, is there certain musicians? Are there young actors and actresses? Because um, in a way, they're also the ones looking at it and with their phones yeah. sitting there in the front row as well. So, um, so perhaps we'll be able to understand that um, when we see the front row. But maybe it's not just about the models either. It's about who else mm. is, is experiencing yeah. the... Yeah. The show. Um, what would you like to see happen in fashion to make it a little more palatable? A little bit more honesty and a little bit more um, just focus, I suppose, mm -hmm. from people who are not trying to experiment in in every which way and direction to to find uh, what they think is the, is the good balance. I know that it's it's hard, but um, we can't all go for the same customer. Mm -hmm. uh, we shouldn't all try and go for the same customer. So perhaps if um, just... It's that online ethos of like mm -hmm. more is more and more. You know, like when online publishing started, it's like when it's print, people are perfectly happy for something to be niche. But as soon as the online space started, it's like it, everything's about views and quantity. Yeah, and the idea of doing something it. small yeah. online is yeah. like really weird to people. Even people who would like willfully do a magazine that is quite cult and small mm -hmm. and almost get celebrated mm -hmm. for that. There's a glut of them at the moment. If you, if you like, oh yeah, we did this great video and it's got like, you know, I don't know, 2000 views. It's mm -hmm. seen as being like, you know, not influential or not. Yeah. Whereas actually a magazine that was really fantastic that got 2000 People, people in hairdressers. It's, <laughs> it's like really weird that this yeah. online space is like this idea. That I think we have to think has to be self curating because I think I even look at some online magazines and just think, why is that even an article? Yeah, like mm -hmm. that's you know, don't make content for the sake of it, yeah. and it's the same with fashion. Don't make a garment for the sake of it because all it feels like is that we're just being panicked, mm -hmm. and you know one of the things and that I think fed. is and force fed and I think it's very it's very hard at the moment when you're looking at your bottom line and you've got your you know the people that are funding you and you've got the stock exchange breathing down your throat mm -hmm. you know to to actually stick to your guns and go no this is the mm -hmm. product this is the brand and it might not be fashionable and trendy this year but we're just going to ride it out yeah because you know you're going to hit a trend again at some Everything point. Everything goes around in circles. Yeah. That's the thing. Where it's like, you know, I, I kind of admire those brands that just kind of quietly keep going. Like the Margaret Howell show was today and I was kind of like, you know, how, like I actually find something like Margaret Howell really refreshing at the moment where it's just Margaret Howell and it is what it is and it's built yeah. this amazing business and people who love Margaret Howell love Margaret Howell and Margaret Howell has no interest in getting like some, you know, young influencer to engage with Margaret Howell because yeah. they're never going to yeah. like it. You know? And yeah. I think that's really important to still have those voices who do what they do and do it with like integrity. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I, talking about Eckhaus Lata, I mean, that is a brand that I feel like has presented itself in complete and utter sincerity. You know, diversity is, their diversity is not about tokenism. It is about purely it's intertwined into their beliefs, their DNA. <sighs> And those brands are so rare and it'd be so great to see more of those brands celebrated, similar to Eckhaus Lata, um, where, you know, what they preach is actually what they believe in. It's not a matter of like, will this generate more sales? Yeah. Um, and Eckhaus Lata started off really sincerely and has taken off, you know, hugely, mm. I think. I mean, you know. Again, it's about the sense of sincerity. Yeah. And even though their casting is about characters, it's also their actual friends. Yeah. But also so, being absolutely. aware that you don't have to reach everyone. Like, I mm -hmm. always talk about this when I teach with young students. It's like people have such a conservative idea about what success is. Mm -hmm. And it's like maybe, maybe you become a designer and, and you only sell to, like, you know, you have 15 clients and you sell on a made to measure basis. and, and it makes you enough that you're afforded a living doing what you do. You might not make a lot, but you make enough. That's success as a fashion. You don't need to show a fashion. You don't need all of that. And it's the, yeah. I think that's slightly the problem at the moment is like, like I, Nazir talks about that. Nazir Mazar in the in fashion interview we did with him is this idea. He just wants to do what he enjoys doing and do it freely. And he's like, I don't want, you know, 
thousands of stores. He's like, I don't want like yeah, a Mount Street store. I don't want a perfume. I don't want to sell on Netta Porter. Like he was like, I just want to do what I do. Love his life. <laughs> exactly. But that's really important. That I think that that young kids, particularly as we talked about, given there's so many people going into fashion school at the moment, being pumped out of fashion school like realising that there's not room for everyone on the London Fashion Week schedule and there's not room for everyone to work at, you know, the London-based magazines, but there's other opportunities, like, that can be yeah. carved out to do stuff. Like, I think that's... You can make those opportunities for yourself. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Maybe that's a good optimistic note to end on. Should we give the... Fa also, like, has anyone... Has anyone seen any, like, previews of the Versace movie or anything? It's not out yet, No, no, no. they've pushed it. They've pushed it they've to 2018, it. yeah. I know. Desperate. Mm. It's quite yeah. exciting. But that's such <laughs> as the cult of personality around her. That, like, can you imagine if someone make a movie about, like, I don't know, like, oh, Matty Boven or something? Like, it's like, <laughs> um, that would, I'd actually go to... Yeah, I'd, But do you know what I mean? Like, you realise, like, this, like, how huge she is that, like, you know, you're... There was already the film. Yeah. Yeah. And who's playing her? Oh, my God, is wasn't it, it like a Showtime kind of mommy dearest-esque, like, type of film? Yeah, it's Penelope, it's Penelope Cruz, Cruz, isn't it? Isn't I mean, it? that'd it's be amazing. Fabulous. I need to watch it. Jane long for the day he's played by Penelope Cruz. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, should we give Donald Trump such a big round of applause? We shall.